Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome back to another fantastic deck tech for Commander. Today I believe we have our first deck tech that doesn't revolve any blue cards. It's Gav, Gure of Spores. Although I think some people pronounce it Gave. Gav is a legendary creature, obviously. Fungus Shaman, he's a 0-0, zero, zero, but he enters the battlefield with 5 one, one counters on it. It's also important to note that this is not a, um, a triggered ability. This just happens automatically. There's, you can't respond to this. Um, he has two activated abilities. Pay one and remove one a 1-1 one, one counter from a creature you control, and you get a 1-1 one, one green sapling. Second ability is pay one and sacrifice a creature. Put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature. As you can probably guess by his abilities, um, Gave is a really nasty creature because he can also make himself very big if you have a lot of creatures that you can sacrifice. But at the same time, he's also really good at generating um, creature tokens as well. Because of his ability to um, have um, a, be a sack outlet as well as a pumping engine, you can do a lot of very degenerate things with him. Arguably, if you wanted to, you could make this kind of a deck that kind of uses sort of a birthing pod, um, evolutionary leap-like strategy, as it does have a lot of sack outlets. And anyway, this deck is actually really nice because you can either generate a whole horde of tokens or just try to win by general damage. But let's get into this deck tech right away and start off by saying that since Gav's abilities require a lot of mana to use consistently within a turn, you're going to need a lot of mana, which is why we have quite a bit of ramp. And starting off, we have a pair of signets. Considering white is actually the probably the most important color, as next to green as well, um, you may want to try to run the Selesnia signet in addition to the Orzhov signet, but it's really up to you. We have these two rampy creatures, Sakura Tribe Elder, which is rampant growth that can block, and Nest Invader, which gives us an Eldrazi friend that we can sack for a colorless mana. You could also try, probably try a couple of those uh, similar creatures that have Eldrazi Scions from Battle for Zendikar, but honestly I just like Nest Invader because he's cheap and affordable. We have our two copies of Cultivate, and by this we have one copy of Cultivate and one copy of Kodama's Reach. They basically just do the same thing, but it's nice because they thin out our deck for lands, and give us some ramp in the process. We have an Awakening Zone. I think this also used to be a uh, From Beyond. I honestly would either run one or the other, um, simply because they're very similar. But honestly, for this deck, I kind of find that From Beyond is actually a little bit better. And I'll get to why that is in a moment. Up next, we have a really big Nest Invader, which is Kozilex Predator, which basically is almost two Nest Invaders for the price of, well, two Nest Invaders. We also run an Explosive Vegetation for the same purposes. Up next is our first Planeswalker, Garak Wildspeaker. Honestly, I kind of figured I'd use him for ramp, but to be honest, he actually makes a good token generator as well, and considering we run a lot of things that can pump creatures, it's really nice to have. To be honest, Garak actually gives our uh, team of little creatures a chance to have an alpha, alpha Strike if we can get them to over 4 loyalty. And finally, we have Gilded Lotus. There actually are quite a few expensive spells that are around 7 or 8 mana in this deck. So it's nice to have a guaranteed way to get over that hump. Now, like I said, this deck can win by general damage, but you're not always going to be able to do so, simply because your opponent's likely going to have something that usually holds down one creature, in a sense. This is why we like to have the option of going long and having several different cards that produce various types of tokens. To start things off, we have three two-drop um, token producers. Um, some are easier to get online than others, um, but we have the classic Bitter Blossom for the annoying um, fairy and upkeep, or one life each upkeep. And where Militia Captains need, um, usually we'll, we, we will have four creatures, considering there are lots of ways to get creatures. And uh, once we flip her, uh, we basically have a Bitter Blossom that doesn't really take away our life. And Jage Maze is nice if we, um, it's a nice early game because it gives us something to do if we need it. And late game, since we're going to have lots of mana, you're going to get a lot of sapperlings if need. Spawn Wrath is kind of just the card with a target on its head. It usually gets sniped simply because it gets out of hand really, really quickly. Um, so it's kind of nice to just kind of make your opponent burn out a removal spell. Martial Coop is basically our board wipe slash token generator. It can be used to generate lots of tokens if need be, but if we pay over 5 mana, it becomes a board wipe, in addition to giving us a bunch of tokens after we wipe the board. Going back to what I was saying more about white being the most important card, we got White Sun Zenith. Um, just a nice way re to reuse a way to generate tokens. Knight Captain of Eos. This is interesting because um, there are several ways we can get it back, and I guess you can say sort of give it kind of a blinking effect. 
So um, you'll get a lot of ways to get soldiers. There's also lots of other ways to get soldiers. But um, this is honestly just kind of the way we kind of win um, kind of similar matchups where people are trying to kill us with a bunch of tokens in a way that we can basically fog them to death if they commit to an attack. Increasing devotion just when we want to get back in the game. Um, the one thing you probably realize about this deck is it's incredibly resilient and essentially if you ever wipe your board or if someone wipes your board, the deck can get right back into it. So it might seem weird that it may have some board wipes, but to tell you the truth, it actually usually doesn't matter so so much considering there's always a way to get back in the game. Next up we have the $65 doubling season. Yes, this is a judge foil. Doubling season is absolutely phenomenal in this deck considering the deck runs around 1-1 one, one counters and creature tokens. You can also use Parallel Lives, which is kind of similar if you can't find or afford a doubling season. There was also another card that was released in the Commander expansions that is very similar. I can't remember its name, but it, it, it's basically a doubling season for everyone, not just yourself. Um, but yeah, doubling season is absolutely amazing considering what this deck does. The classic Grave Titan, I mean it's Grave Titan, getting zombies whenever it attacks or um, enters the battlefield. Pretty darn sweet. Um, going back to Theros standard, we have Elspeth, the Sun's champion. Um, just wonderful. Does what it wants. And honestly, you can actually take Gave down to four by removing his counters. Um, have Elspeth destroy all creatures with power four or greater, and then take Gave back up, which is kind of neat. And finally, we have the um, Avenger of Zendikar, which basically turns all your ramp spells into threats. If you have a horde of plant tokens, which you likely will. And it's just a classic card that just gets the job done. With all these creature tokens, it helps to have a way to pump them. Starting off with Abs and Ascendancy, this is kind of a one-time pump effect as it, as it will give all your creatures one one counters, but it's actually kind of nice as um, you also can get a lot of spirits out, and if you have a way to sacrifice a creature over and over again, you will get basically indefinite one one white spirits with them. Beastmaster Ascension, since we attack with so many creatures, it makes sense that we have an enchantment that can pump our creatures for doing what the deck does best. Also, it just, it's an absolute blot whenever it works right. Soren, Lord of Innistrad. You could also use Soren, Solemn Visitor. Um, however, I like Soren, Lord of Innistrad because he actually takes up for giving you tokens. And um, it's nice because the minus two is actually permanent. So it's not just temporary. Even though um, Solemn Visitor is still pretty good in this deck, I, I've always liked Soren, Lord of Innistrad better. Uh, Marshall's Anthem. This is uh, another one, actually one of my favorite cards in this deck, simply because it usually will, if you kick it, usually it will get back more than one creature. Plus, it's a pump spell in the form of Glorious Anthem. To... Next up, I have Cather's Crusade. Considering we have so many token generators, um, this gets out of hand pretty quickly, and you'll get a trigger for each token that enters the battlefield at the same time. And, yeah, things get pretty out of hand pretty quickly with this. Since we're not super evasive, we have a copy of Eldrazi Monument. And God with Flying is pretty darn scary, and especially if he's also indestructible to boot. This one may have been put better off in the ramp section, but we have a copy of Mirari's Wake, which is a glorious anthem and also a mana doubler. This is a classic card, and it's kind of hard to find, but if you can find it, it's well worth playing in this deck. And finally, we have our super shiny Elesh Norn, the Grand Cenobite. Um, this is basically just the big finisher here. Usually if we have a um, horde of creatures out, this usually ends the game right away um, if your opponent has nothing to block or an instant speed board wipe or something like that. Uh, next up we have, I guess you could call the additional sack outlets or the, um, it's, it's, I guess it's kind of more the loopy cards that can uh, give us advantage and, and give us kind of, I want to say infinite combos in a sense. Um, starting off with a Skull Clamp, this just generates us a ton of advantage. But if you have a lot of mana, you can use it over and over again with the next few cards that I'm about to talk about. These cards I speak of are arguably probably the scariest cards in the deck, believe it or not. Um, they are Young Wolf and Strangle Root Geist. Um, as you can see, they both have Undyne, and it's very good because um, considering we run Gav, um, this can be exploited to a very great effect. If we have enough mana, we can essentially basically sacrifice our Undying Creature, get a 1-1 one, one counter on another creature, the Undying Creature will come back, and later we can remove it with Goff and get a creature. So if we have infinite mana, we can basically have a really big creature and infinite saplings. 
It's kind of funny because I've had some pro opponents who've kind of laughed at me for playing a card like this, and then they lost the next turn. To get this mana, we use Ashnan's Altar, which allows us to sacrifice a creature for two colorless mana. <clears throat> By sacrificing Young Wolf, we get two colorless mana, and we can use one of those manas to um, remove the counter if we have Goblin play and get a Sapling, and then we can keep sacrificing the wolf to the altar and keep repeating the process. In short, you'll have infinite colorless mana, infinite saplings, and a really large general. Or you can just make everyone lose the game with this combo by playing Zulkort Cutthroat. Flush Carver's kind of a neat little thing that just adds an additional sacrifice outlet and can give us a lot of value at the same time. Finally, we have our, I guess you could call it our uh, draw cycling cards. Um, some of them work a little bit differently from the others. But starting on the right, we have uh, Fecundity, which basically means every time a player sacrifices a creature, that player can draw a card. Keep in mind, it's a May. Um, because we have that loop with Young Wolf or another undying creature. Um, <clears throat> Fecundity becomes just ridiculous, as we can basically draw our whole deck in the process. Um, Overwall with Mysteries isn't quite as good. It does give us clues instead, but believe it or not, um, it's more used for uh, mid-game when we're trying to develop our, um, our board state and our combos and all the other good stuff. But it's a lot of fun and it's very useful. And finally we have Smothering Abomination. Um, like I said, this is very similar to Fecundity because we can just keep sacrificing a creature and draw a card. And also it's a pretty big Eldrazi to boot. And that's why I was saying earlier, this is one of the reasons why we uh, run the um, From Beyond rather than Awakening Zone. So we can fetch that if need be. And finally, we have the utility cards, which are just the nice support cards that are uh, round out the deck and help it do things that the other cards potentially probably couldn't do. Starting off with Sensei's Divining Top. Although Divining Top is nice in any deck, I don't think it's a requirement for this deck, but it definitely does help a lot. Putrefy is a nice bit of spot removal here. Uh, we could run Maelstrom Pulse if we wanted to, um, but I believe I'm using them in a deck right now. Uh, one Court of Calling, simply because we can get a creature that we want at instant speed, and considering we have a lot of nice creatures which do a nice variety of things, this kind of can become our instant speed toolbox. Increasing Ambition, just one of my favorite tutors, gives us a card upon first casting and then card advantage upon the second. Decree of Pain, this is another board wipe. Um, this is nice because even though it will destroy our creatures in the process, we'll just draw a whole bunch of cards, and since we have a ton of tokens, yeah, you can imagine just how many cards we draw. Utter End, just for permanent sniping. Um, if you have them, you can also run um, Anguished Unmaking or Vindicate if you have them in this slot. I'm just running Utter End for the moment. Here's Dictate of Erebos, which is arguably our one-sided board wipe. If we have some sort of sacrifice outlet, we can basically destroy all our opponent's creatures at instant speed, and it's just really terrible, and it pisses everybody off. And finally, we have our lands. Um, lands, I guess you could say, haven't really been updated, so they're... Could be a lot more lands that could be beneficial for this, but I'll go through them quickly. Like I say, we mostly have the white lands, so most of the lands are black white. Um, there's one overgrown tomb. I believe we did used to have a. Um, it, this deck does run a um, windswept teeth and a um, the verdant catacomb for fetching, but it's uh, not necessary. Um, we got some nice utility here. We got um, probably, should I probably point this out <coughs> in addition to. Um, Land Destruction, we also have uh, Shizo the Death Storehouse, which makes uh, Gave um, evasive. Full Rast Stronghold, like I say, more ways to get stuff back if need be. Ova Palace is actually very relevant in this deck because it makes Gav bigger. Um, and also gives him another counter so he can use his ability if need be. Gavany Township, our land that pumps everything. Here's Blight Woodland, which is another nice ramping land. Well, the Archangel in case we need life. And here are basics. We run quite a few plans, six plans. Actually, we're on a lot more forests. I don't know why we're running more forests when white is the most important color. But like I say, white and green are actually the mo the the most important colors in the deck. It's just that we run a lot of white spirals that are very mana intensive, like white sun zenith and elish norn, and four swamps. Come on. And that was Gob, Guru of Spores. It's a very fun EDH deck, and if you like green, like sacrificing creatures, and even just pretty much doing a whole lot of really cool combos in EDH, this is a wonderful general for you. The nice thing about Gob is you don't have to necessarily use these combos. You can make the deck however you want, and there are several other great options.